Good evening, everyone. Um, since we've been uh, going for a while now, I thought I owed it to you to do a little something about dreams, because that seems to be uh, the place that people like to start. Hi, Dan. Nice to see you tonight. Um, so um, I'm going to start with dreams tonight, and I... Uh, I'm going to begin because uh, usually it takes a few minutes for enough people to join us uh, in the group. So I'm going to begin with uh, a dream that I had uh, last year, which I described in uh, the spaghetti joint last year. So uh, uh, for a few minutes, uh, I'm going to show you this uh, archetypal dream I had. Uh, then I'm going to talk about um, some of the quotes about Dr. Jung's ideas about dreams. And I'll tell you about another dream I had, which was also quite archetypal a couple of days ago. Uh, I'm not going to analyze these dreams, but I just want to uh, tell you about them so that you uh, see uh, what I mean by an archetypal dream. And then after we've talked about the young quotes uh, about the dreams and so on, uh, then I'm going to move into this section of Civilization in Transition, uh, which is volume 10 of Dr. Jung's collected works. And in that volume, uh, there is a very interesting uh, article, essay, called Woman in Europe, which was written in 1927, and it's strangely applicable today as well. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm going to begin the process here uh, by showing you the, um, the archetypal dream that I did last year. This is going to take a, a few minutes, but I think it's worth it. I think you'll find it quite interesting. Um, and so here we come. And... Uh, that's what this is playing. Oh, I'll tell you about my dream. Oh, this is an awesome dream. Um, I, I haven't had time to write it up yet, but... Um, I did. I actually did my first experiment in years on active imagination in conjunction with this dream. So, um, so I'll tell you where the this changeover happened because I had the dream early in the morning, three four days ago, and then I wanted to know what the rest of it was about. And so I carried it on in active imagination. And, wow. Okay, so, so here's the dream. Um, and so here's the dream. I'm in a southern town, kind of a, of a 19th century southern town, and I'm a northern reporter, and I want to go get... Uh, pictures of a Ku Klux Klan rally. Okay, except that there's this constant repeat that I can only go to the ra rally if I'm in a pair, if there's another person with me. And I'm thinking, okay, that's sort of like, you know, you have to have somebody to vouch for you type thing. So you can't go alone, you have to go in a pair. And so, I'm trying to figure this out, and I realize that I'm in the back of an old-time sheriff's office, like you see on Gunsmoke or something like that, right? And I come out into the front of the sheriff's office where the sheriff's desk is, and the sheriff is sitting there, and he stands up and he's got long white hair, really long white hair, and, and he's very... He's relatively thin and so on, but he's got this long white hair. And I think, well, maybe I could get the sheriff to go with me under a sheet to be my pair to do this. Okay. 
and and so um, so I, I'm asking the sheriff. So I'm asking the sheriff to to go with me, okay, as my the the match for my pair when I wake up. So I woke up, okay. So then um, I just put myself back in the situation and did the act of imagination. So the act of imagination was awesome because the sheriff says to me, oh, we don't need the sheets. We can just go outside. And we go outside and there's this throng of people in white sheets, okay. And I'm saying, oh, and we're not wearing a sheet, and here's the sheriff, here's me, and here's this throng of white, white sheeted KKK members, right? And then suddenly, this group parts like the Red Sea parted from Moses. Unbelievable. It just, the sea of white figures just separates, and there's a path down the middle between the two seas of white, of uh, white, sheets and at the end of it there's a black sun coming up the sun is rising and the sun is black and it's actually eclipsed and so the sun is eclipsed you can see the brightness of the sun around the eclipse uh, and so the sheriff and I start to walk down this path and the next thing I know we're in a, a meadow and that's the end of it. But, but I mean, there's some awesome uh, archetypal things there. First of all, there's the greater personality, the sheriff, and the sort of an image of God, right? Um, or the self. You could think of it as the self. And so he's saying, no, we don't need it. We don't need no <laughs> damn cheat. We could just go out, right? And then I realized that the requirement of the pair is that everybody that's going anywhere, including to a KKK rally, has to take both their ego and their self. So it is a pair, right? And uh, then we go out and we have this archetypal scene of Moses spreading the, the waters, Right, and, and the black sun with the, with the eclipse, the sun with the eclipse at the end of this path. And I can look down the path and there's this black sun. And, and uh, I found that quite hopeful, actually, because, you know, it, it occurred to me, I think it occurred to me during the AI that, well, when there's a, an eclipse, the eclipse will move aside and, and brightness will come back to the earth uh, sometime soon. But anyway, any comments about that? That's well, your active imagination, was that something you did like the next day or that day? No, it was that morning. That morning. I did it. I did it within a couple hours. Of and it. you picked up from where the dream ended. Right. Your imagination. Right. I, I have a dream book that I've been keeping for a couple of years next to my bed and sometimes in the middle of the night if I wait if I can wake up and remember a dream I'll, I'll sort of trip out to my wife's desk <laughs> turn on a very low light and write it out and then go back to bed and so I did that in this case so explain the technique of having to get into the right for the well, so if you don't write, write a dream down, you're going to lose it very quickly, right? It's hard to remember it. By 10 o'clock in the morning and you've had three coffees, sorry, it's gone, right? <laughs> and and so, so you have to write the, these dreams down when you have them. You can't wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning with a big dream and say, oh, I'll write it down in the morning. You have to write it down then because you won't remember it in the morning. And, and so that's just a discipline that you have to do. Um, and then for the act of imagination, all I did was just sort of close my eye, eyes and... Put my, I, I, I brought my dream book down next to my computer because I started typing the AI part of it, right? And that's how I do AIs. And so um, 
I brought it down next to my computer. I kept my computer very down low, like I did back when I was writing the novel. And then I put myself back in the sheriff's uh, office with the sheriff. And then, the, and I, you know, I had asked him to, I don't remember whether I asked him to be my partner in the dream or in the AI, but in any case, at some point there I did. And then he says, oh, we don't need any sheets. We'll just go out there. Okay, I'm going to move this ahead a bit because um, there's a, another two and a half minutes or so uh, that I think you might find interesting. And uh, then we'll go ahead with the class um, or with the meeting. So here... Reporter, you want to get the news out. Right. It's my. It's kind of, kind of my job, but sound the alarm. Yeah, but there's a rule that says I have to go in a pair. I can't go alone, and it turns out that the pair is the self, right? An image of the self. Number one and number two, and number two comes and he stands up and he's a big guy and he's got he's got a lot of wisdom and he's very confident and sure of himself and sort of godlike and and we step out on the porch together uncovered and the crowd just parts it doesn't you know it's not threatening us in any way it just sort of gets out of the way and obviously the sun the black sun, even the black sun is a mandala symbol, which, which is a centering symbol, right? And it's sort of a symbol that's saying, okay, it's going to be all right, even though it's black, right? Because I could see the light all around the... Wasn't the black sun the... Pardon? No, with the eclipse. The sun or the earth will move away eventually. Oh, the, the moon will move away. Oh, the moon, I'm sorry. The, uh, Pardon? In alchemy, isn't that the energy of the black sun? <clears throat> yeah, it could be. That's right. So, it's the shadow. Pardon? It's the shadow. Well, it's the shadow that everyone's afraid of, right? And, and it's darkening it's the sun. The it's, well, I mean, I was, I was reading you um, talking about the sun. And the black sun is uh, part of the bright sun. And it's the, it casts a shadow. That's what he described. It's the Enantiodromia. I can never say Pardon? that. Pardon? Enantiodromia. Yeah. I can yeah. <laughs> well, be, because the image of the sun at the end of this path, there's a path that has to be circuit has to be navigated it's i'm not at the sun I'm, it's far away it's, it's just rising right but it's a path to the sun and an enantiodromia is suggested because it's an eclipse and i know that the moon will move away so to me it's saying that okay that's about enough of that uh, so let me come back to you here um, unfortunately, my camera is right where I want to be looking, and so uh, what I want to do is get rid of the sheriff's office now, so it's um, not playing, hopefully, later on. Uh, because uh, we had that problem with videos playing over videos before. Um, but let's see, that's not the one. I want, I want the one about the dreams. Where did that go? Okay. Sorry for me fumbling around here. Let's see. <laughs> Get myself in the picture here. Um, all right, there's a 
few quotes about dreams. Um, uh, tonight I've been working with this book, uh, which I mentioned last week, uh, which is called C.G. Young's Psychological Reflections, and it's edited by Yolanda Jacobi and RFC Hall. And as I explained last week, RFC Hall was an, uh, a man in a wheelchair most of his life, and he dedicated his life to translating Dr. Young's work uh, from German into English. And uh, so he, among all Young's followers, had, had the closest experience with uh, Dr. Young's work. And uh, let's see if I can make this. Um, I'm going to try to make the, um, the words a little bigger so that you can see them more easily. Okay. All right, so. Um, these are quotes on dreams uh, from this book, C.G. Young, Psychological Reflections, by Yolanda Jacobi and R.F.C. Hall, uh, published by Princeton University Press. And I just, um, this book has like 40, um, count them, 40 uh, pages of quotes about dreams. But as you'll see, these dreams are all over Dr. Jung's oeuvre. And so they're not necessarily, or the quotes are not necessarily easy to find. Um, so let me just look and see if there's anything I should be responding to on chat. Uh, does a circular sun, Dan asks, represent wholeness, the darkness of the eclipse being the shadow. Uh, yes, I think it does. I think we're talking about uh, a mandala here. And so I did mention in that video that I thought the circular sun did represent a mandala. And this camera is a little bit cockeyed. Let me see if I can get it back into position. All right. I guess that's all right. And um, so, and yes, the uh, eclipse uh, did represent the shadow. And uh, this date, February 2nd, 2017, was uh, about 10 days after the new administration had uh, taken power in the United States. And so um, uh, I was personally feeling a little down about that. And so I saw the administration as that shadow. <laughs> but um, symbolically, it could be something like that for everyone. Um, and D. Lara <laughs> remembers, <laughs> remembers deja vu. Okay. Uh, okay, so... Uh, these quotes, uh, dreams are impartial, spontaneous products of the unconscious psyche outside the control of the will. They are pure nature. That was the interesting quote that I wanted to emphasize. They're pure nature. They show us the unvarnished natural truth and are therefore fitted as nothing else is to give us back an attitude that accords with our basic human nature when our consciousness has strayed too far from its foundations and run into an impasse. And uh, so you'll hear my uh, dream a little bit later where I seem to have run into an impasse, but um, it's one that I have feel com comfortable with now. But uh, partially because of the dream and active imagination I had, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. So, uh, next quote, as against Freud's view that the dream is essentially a wish fulfillment, I hold that the dream is a spontaneous self-portrayal in symbolic form 
of the actual situation in the unconscious. So what Dr. Young is saying is when you have a dream, it's reflecting your actual situation at that time. And so um, the dream shows the inner truth and reality of the patient as it really is, not as I conjecture it to be, and not as he would like it to be, but as it is. Okay, so uh, in other words, dreams from a Jungian psychology perspective are messages from the unconscious, and they're a pure reflection of uh, your inner truth at that given point in time. And so moving on, there's just a couple more of these, although one of them. Well, I guess there's a few more. Okay, so the view that dreams are merely the imaginary fulfillments of repressed wishes, Freudian, is hopelessly out of date. There are, it is true, dreams which manifestly represent wishes or fears, but what about all the other things? Dreams may contain ineluctable truths, psychological pronouncements, illusions, wild fantasies, memories, plans, anticipations, irrational experiences, even telepathic visions, and heaven knows what besides. And so you might think about your own, uh, your own conscious psyche and how many different things you think of in a day in various ways. Um, and, um, you know, when in Buddhism, where they're trying to teach you how to meditate, um, you're trying to put basically everything out of your mind so that you can be in, in pure, um, pure bliss, let's say. And, and um, most Westerners have what they call monkey mind at the beginning, which is all kinds of things start to come into your head. And, you know, that's really true all the time for most of us, I think, that um, we just have an innumerable things coming into our consciousness uh, all the time. And probably 90% of them we don't pay any attention to because we're doing something else, <laughs> but they're still there. And um, so the same thing is happening. Uh, at night when you're asleep, except you don't have your conscious will just trying to stop it. Um, so, uh, next quote, the perspective function, on the other hand, is an, is an, anticipa <laughs> is an anticipation in the unconscious of future conscious achievements. Um, I'm sorry for the raspberry I just blew. It wasn't at you. It was at me for not being able to pronounce that word. Something like a preliminary exercise or sketch or a plan roughed out in advance. Um, so let me read that again since I interrupted. I'm sorry. The prospective function, on the other hand, is an anticipation in the unconscious of future conscious achievements something like a preliminary exercise or sketch or a plan roughed out in the future. The occurrence of prospective dreams cannot be denied. It would be wrong to call them prophetic because at bottom they are no more prophetic than a medical diagnosis or a weather forecast. They are merely an anticipatory combination of probabilities. Um, but need not necessarily agree in every detail. One in the, one in the, hmm, I might have miscopied this. Okay, in any case, in the latter, in the latter case, we can speak of prophecy. It can prophesy, but it's a very vague prophecy that the perspective function of dreams is sometimes greatly superior to the combinations we can consciously foresee is not surprising since a dream results 
from a fusion of subliminal elements and is thus a combination of all the perceptions, thoughts, and feelings which consciousness has not registered because of their feeble accentuation. In addition, dreams can rely on subliminal memory traces that are no longer able to influence consciousness effectively. With regard to prognosis, therefore, dreams are often in a much more favorable position than consciousness. So he's talking in terms of psychotherapy, but um, basically what he's saying is your psyche can pull all the elements that you face in life together into one ball and project it out to you in the form of a symbol of some sort. Um, and that can be a pretty wild and woolly dream, as you'll see uh, when I discuss my dream from the other morning. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it's a dream that I could not possibly have thought up myself. Uh, but in any case, um, it can, it can give you probabilities. Very interesting that he's using the term probabilities here since he doesn't like, uh, statistics very much. Um, so anyway, moving on. Okay. Dreams are as simple or as complicated as the dreamer himself, only they are always a little bit ahead of the dreamer's consciousness. I do, not, I do not understand my own dreams any better than any of you, for they are always... I'm sorry, I mistyped that too. Uh, they are always beyond my grasp, and I have the same trouble... Uh, with them as anyone who knows nothing about dream interpretation. Knowledge is no advantage when it is a matter of one's own dreams. Well, what I would say about this uh, is that this was fairly early in Dr. Jung's career, um, and, or let's say at midpoint, 1935, at least his writing career. And I suspect that he could uh, figure out what his dreams meant pretty well by then, or certainly later in life he ne definitely did. And uh, so a couple of other, other interesting things here. Nature commits no error. So nature is telling you something uh, in a dream, and it, if you don't get it, then it just passes away, and, um, and you go on with your conscious life but you can learn something if you pay attention. Um, Clark says, that's the word for the marriage of the feminine and ma What's the word for the marriage of the feminine and masculine? Um, okay, you're thinking of the, um, uh, you're thinking of the chemical marriage or, or the, um, well, if I don't think about it, right now, maybe <laughs> it will come to me. Um, it's um, the conjunctio, okay, or the conjunction. And, um, uh, and we were talking about this today in terms of enlightenment, uh, because if in, in Buddhism, um, individuation if you achieve individuation in the Jungian sense, then you are also enlightened. <laughs> okay, and that, that's achieving the alchemical marriage and, uh, of, of the opposites, all the opposites, not only masculine and feminine. But yes, uh, conjunctio is the right, right term, I think. Um, there's, there's another... Uh, term for um, marriage of the masculine and feminine, but it, it escapes me at the moment, I'm sorry to say. Okay, so, um, oh, the, I know what it is. It's the heroes gamos, okay? <laughs> that is the combination of all things masculine and feminine, the heroes gamos. 
um, and uh, yeah, so everything either flows that way or in the opposite direction. It can also flow in the negative way, and um, and um, that's one of the main points of Mysterium Conjunctionis. In all opposites, they either tend to flow together or to flow apart. And, um, and so you can think of a, a pair of magnets. Either they'll click together or they won't go together at all. And uh, we are currently seeing that in our red state, blue state neurosis in the United States uh, politically. Um, and so somehow we have to uh, come up with a stronger ma magnet that'll draw both red and blue to us. Now, of course, in the mid 20th century, um, we had World War II. Um, and while the United States participated in World War I, we didn't much compared to the European countries. I mean, uh, the British lost a whole, whole generation of young men. Um, we entered the war only in, really in 1918 or late 1917, so three years after the carnage had gotten going. And it was over in November of 1918. So we were only in World War I for about uh, 10 months, something like that. Um, but World War II, um, again, we didn't get in early, uh, but we definitely were in enough to have a, a lot of uh, a lot of things hit us. Um, and so let's see. When we approach the opposite, Clark says, when we approach the opposite, though, it pulls out our shadow, as Edinger says. Um, yes, it will pull out our shadow. And that's the issue. I mean, you shouldn't really be trying to individuate per se unless you've got a strong enough ego to handle the, um, the forces that you unleash when you do that. I mean, the way of doing it is not difficult to say. It's, it's do a reflection on everything you love or hate and, um, and you'll start to see it come out. Okay, now some of us uh, have it come out involuntarily, uh, as was the case with me. And um, then if you have an understanding of what Dr. Jung was saying, you'll be a lot better off trying to deal with your individuation. Um, I've been dealing with it now for 30 years, so I'm quite familiar <laughs> with the opposites. Uh, and, um, okay. Okay, all right. So the last quote here, nature is often obscure or impenetrable, but she is not like man, deceitful. We must therefore take it that the dreams is, is just what it pretends to be, neither more nor less. If it shows something in a negative light, there is no reason for assuming that it is meant uh, positively. Or, yeah, I think that's that it is meant positively. I'm sorry, my taping. I was flying trying to get the all these things typed out today, uh, so that I could show you them on the on the um, video. I'm sorry, uh, Steve. Uh, I missed your question on uh, Periscope. It disappeared before I could see it. Uh, so uh, if you want to retype it, I'll try again. Uh, or you can come over to the YouTube channel uh, where we have a chat going on and your, your chat points don't get um, disappeared on us. Um, 
And so if you would uh, come to Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group on YouTube and you can participate with the group and I, I won't lose your chat comments. Okay, so I don't, what I don't see here is any comments on chat about the various uh, points that I have made here that I've emphasized. And, um, and so I'll just go on and um, read to you this dream that I had the other morning. And, um, and then we'll move on to Women in Europe. Um, so uh, this was uh, on May 6th at 6.45. The dreams that I normally catch, and I guess I can get rid of this screen with the dreams so that you can see my, me entirely. Um, let me center myself again. Um, okay, so uh, normally the, the big dreams that I'm able to catch, I catch early in the morning. And also I've noticed that um, I normally either take Tylenol or ibuprofen before going to bed. Uh, but I've noticed that if I take uh, acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, um, I tend to have vivid dreams, and I tend to have them early in the morning. Uh, I don't have so many dreams if I take ibuprofen. So if you're interested in catching your dreams, they might be wild and woolly, though, um, then you could think about taking... Uh, one or two Tylenol before you go to bed, and that may, uh, I don't know what it does, but it somehow releases some blockage that uh, the ibuprofen doesn't release. Uh, okay, so here's the dream. I am walking through a waterside park with Debbie, who's my wife. It is on a river harbor that lets out to the sea. I notice that it is crowded with ships, and it is 4 p.m. None of the ships are underway. At 4 p.m., all the ships start blowing their horns, and I say to Debbie that they are all honoring the 100th anniversary of Titanic going down. It is a sunny day. I keep walking, but Debbie is no longer with me. And uh, I have a side note here. Of course, it is 106 years since Titanic really sank. But anyway, my dream doesn't know that, apparently. So I keep walking, but Debbie is no longer with me. I come to the edge of the park where there is a... Uh, there is darking... Uh, there is darking... Uh, not darking. There is docking a large, unique yacht is uh, that's tied up there and I start to jump across to the aft end and the owner is there. I ask for permission to come aboard for the ceremony and he grants permission. Then the yacht very easily capsizes to 90 degrees and then I write it also very easily. I comment to the owner that it is easier to write this heavy yacht than a sailfish sailboat I used to own. He says it was designed that way. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the end of the dream. Uh, but I was then awake and I kept myself in the scenario. Uh, I just closed my eyes and just kept imagining this scenario of this uh, river harbor with all the ships and boats in it. And it was a very beautiful day, uh, very great detail in all the ships. And probably there were 50 ships in the harbor in this dream. So anyway, I decided to keep this dream going by active imagination. Uh, and the way you do that is you just close your eyes, try to keep yourself in the uh, scenario of the dream and then um, take notes on whatever happens and don't try to
push it, just let it happen. And so here's how the dream continued. Um, I then realized that a large dark tsunami is headed for the seashore. I hold on to the yacht and as I do so, it breaks free and is moving inland with the tsunami. The other boats don't seem to be around. A second large wave comes and pushes the yacht much further inland. There doesn't seem to be other life around and the yacht is coming down on a mountainside like a scene from Noah's flood. I realize I am above and far from any civilization. I get off as the yacht is on its side because of the keel on the mountainside. I think that God must be creating a new world for me. An ex-cathedra voice says, yes, that's right. As the waters recede, I can see for, for a great distance, but no sign of civilization. I start walking down the mountain toward where I think the seashore might be. In the distance, I see an enormous light god, uh, light god man with a crown, like the saw teeth crown, as in Edinger's book I've been reading, which is which book? Sorry, I'm not sure which book I was referring to. But anyway, um, one of the pictures in one of the Edinger books has a crown that has rays going out from it, like golden rays. And uh, it's like saw teeth. And um, it is very bright. I wonder if he's going to take me on a fly around like Enoch. He says, yes, he is going to, and takes my hand. We are high in the sky, and then, out of the sun, a beautiful fe female figure comes toward me. She is wearing a diaphanous white gown and a crown of gold. Um, then I find myself that I am in the artist's room with Picasso and Francois Gio. Uh, this is because I was that night... Uh, watching uh, the special show uh, Genius, which is about Picasso this year with Antonio Banderas. If you've not seen that, I urge you to watch that series. It's very well done. But I imagine that I'm in the artist room with Picasso and Francoise, and I hear Debbie's footsteps, and I realize it's time to wake up, and that's the end of it. Um, but uh, I wanted to read that to you because of how archetypal uh, that dream is, because we have um, uh, catastrophe, end of the world, uh, and then um, uh, sort of the destruction of the world, and um, then God taking me on a trip like he took Enoch, and finally, this uh, female figure coming out of the sun, uh, which is obviously an Adama figure and a, uh, a soul figure, but I thought that was quite interesting. Um, any comments here? Uh, okay, so Clark says, I 100% agree with your dream if it was about Trump like I think it was. Um, Yes, okay, we're, we're referring back to the first dream, the, the dream about the sheriff's office, and uh, I do agree with you that it, it was about Trump <laughs> from my point of view, So that, uh, because it was my dream, that's my interpretation as well. <laughs> uh, but anyway, for what it's worth. Okay, so now I want to... Um, try to talk to you about women in Europe. And there, it comes from this book, uh, Civilization in Transition. And um, in terms of civilization in transition, generally, um, we have to realize that civilization was, something was moving 
at the end of the 19th century. And uh, probably Nietzsche was the one who, um, who noticed it most clearly, uh, but even William Blake and um, there was a, a poem in the middle of the century, which I neglected to get out because I didn't think of it until just now, uh, but maybe I'll bring it out next week, um, where there was a general unease among uh, Europeans, and uh, Nietzsche felt that unease the most. I mean, he was the probably the most sensitive person at the end of the 19th century. It was partially because he was mentally ill, I acknowledge that. And um, so he wrote Thus Spake Zarathustra, in which he proclaimed that God is dead. And what he meant by that, I believe, is that um, there was no living God in the churches at that time. And, uh, or the churches had sliced and got diced God so much that no one was having a numinous connection with God. And this is when, where Jung came in, because Dr. Jung, then 20 years later, um, started to have his Red Book visions. And because he was the son of a pastor and knew a lot about religion, he was able to um, interpret his visions in a religious way and talk about how the religious experience can be put back into Christianity. Unfortunately, Christianity wasn't ready to listen, so they ignored him. And so a lot of his work in the latter half of his life was trying to explain what he meant by that. And, you know, indeed, I was trying to explain it this very day uh, to my Tibetan Buddhist uh, Lama, uh, who um, wasn't quite getting the idea. He was talking about how um, the experience of enlightenment is luminous. And I said, well, there's a big difference between luminous and numinous. And um, then one of my uh, group members, uh, who's a psychologist, looked it up on her iPhone and she said, well, numinous means divine. And yeah, it means divine in a sense, um, but that definition was put there by somebody who grew up as a Christian. And so, we're not talking about uh, the Christian God. We're talking about an experience of God, an encounter uh, with the greater personality, with the self. And that's quite different from just having light on something. There, there's an experience. I mean, I've talked about um, an occasion in the Naval Academy Chapel when light came across me. And, but the numinous part of that wasn't the fact that light came across me. Yes, that was luminous, but, um, but the experience, the religious experience that was associated with that was numinous, not luminous. <laughs> the luminous part of it was only the uh, step toward numinosity. So uh, once you've experienced, a, a once you've had a religious experience, regardless of which religion you got it from, um, then uh, you don't need the religion anymore. And as a matter of fact, uh, Rinpoche today in our meditation group did acknowledge that that's true of Buddhism as well, Tibetan Buddhism anyway, where um, the Tibetan Buddhists take all these ideas and they slice and dice them. They'll say there are 57 things of this and there's seven of this and there's 32 of that. And your mind goes, oh, 
know, why is there why is there so much division? Well, that's all logos, okay. And this is my discussion about the difference between logos and eros, okay. You can slice and dice things. You can have four hundred sects of Protestant. Protestantism, and each one can differentiate itself from all the other ones, um, but none of that is a religious experience. And so, but Rinpoche did acknowledge to me that once you achieve enlightenment, which I'm going to interpret from a Jungian psychology perspective as once you achieve individuation. Um, once you've had this experience, you have no need for a creed. And Rinpoche did say that that's a teaching in Tibetan Buddhism as well, that uh, once you've had enlightenment, you don't need all these slices and dices. And so I consider that a great achievement that I got, got him to acknowledge that. Okay. Um, now, um, Let's see, what I want to do, I have to add, um, I have to add our um, video. And I, I did a reading of women in Europe, women in Europe earlier today. And so this is now an experiment. I'm going to try to read this paragraph by paragraph and let you participate and, and then as each paragraph goes by uh, discuss it with you and so what I have to do is put that into my system here and okay doesn't like that name That, how's that? Okay, that's all right. Okay, so now. Uh, this evening in the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group, uh, I'll be talking about woman in Europe as so. part of. So now I want to go, uh, what I'm going to do, I have these paragraphs marked by time. So I'm going to set up the time for the first paragraph, which is um, paragraph 263. And so it is at 1216, 216 rather. Okay, now. Please do tell me on the chat if you are not hearing this. Um, what I am going to do is try to play this paragraph by paragraph and follow along with it. Uh, and I'm also going to show you, I hope, Let's see if it comes in the transition. No, it didn't. All right. Um, sorry, just to, to bother you. Okay, what I'm going to have to do is delete that and then put it back in. We'll try that. That might do it. This is, this is all wonderful stuff as long as you can get it.
This is why it won't show. Now I understand. Okay. Hmm. Oh, okay. So you are seeing it. That was the whole idea in the first place. So I don't know why it's not showing in my backstage, but it is showing in the front stage. So uh, you are seeing that. And let's just make this a little bit bigger. Oh, shoot. Now I've gotten rid of... Not good. <laughs> Sorry. There, that's going to do it. Hooray. Except... It's kind of in the way. Hooray. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is play you the paragraphs, and uh, then we'll talk about uh, in each of these uh, paragraphs. 1927. I'm going to read from paragraph 263, which begins about the institution of marriage. The institution of marriage is such a valuable thing, both socially and morally, Religious people even regard it as a sacrament, that it is quite understandable that any weakening of it should be felt as undesirable, indeed scandalous. Human imperfection is always a discord in the harmony of our ideals. Unfortunately, no one lives in the world as we desire, but in the world of actuality where good and evil clash and destroy one another where no creating or building can be done without dirtying one's hands. Whenever things get really bad, there is always someone to assure us amid great applause that nothing has happened and everything is in order. I repeat, anyone who lives and thinks like this is not living in the present. If we examine any marriage with a really critical eye, we shall find, unless acute pressure of circumstances has completely extinguished all signs of psychological trouble, symptoms of its weakening and clandestine disruption, marriage problems, ranging from unbearable moods to neurosis and adultery. Unfortunately, those who can still bear to remain unconscious cannot be imitated. Their example is not infectious enough to induce more conscious people to descend again to the level of mere unconsciousness. Paragraph.
Okay, well, here I'm chatting away with everyone and nobody can hear me, but thank you for bringing that to my attention, Clark. Let me uh, go back and uh, review this. I'm sorry about that. Uh, what I was saying was that this uh, essay, Woman in Europe, was written in 1927, which was approximately uh, 10 years after World War I. And there were huge dislocations in society at that time because millions of men had been killed in Germany, in France, in the UK. Uh, the US got off uh, quite a bit lighter than that. Uh, but there were many women who couldn't find men, m millions of women who could not find men uh, in those countries. And uh, so the issue became uh, what happens with marriage and especially what happens to uh, the idea, the structure of medieval marriage. Um, and, um, and so Clark said we last heard the video. The video was on, but then I stopped it so that I could uh, comment on it. And so what we're talking about is the crisis post-World War I, which was similar to the crisis uh, post-World War II, when 50 million people were killed, but obviously uh, most of the combatants were men, and so there were a very large number of men that were lost, and therefore uh, there were a lot of women that were um, without husbands, and, and uh, one of the things that society needed to do to replenish itself uh, was uh, for women to have children. And obviously they did. They, um, they produced a new generation of children, uh, which launched directly into World War II. <laughs> and, um, and so um, uh, lots of concessions had to be made in marriages. And um, so this essay uh, which was written in 1927, uh, was uh, obviously very significant in terms of societal norms at that time. And, um, and you know, we, we have to look at other societies to think about this. But, uh, for example, in, um, in Muslim culture, uh, where, you know, Christians think it's just awful that um, Muslim men can have four wives. But uh, we have to realize that this uh, structure came up, this societal structure came up because, uh, again, there were a lot of men lost in various battles and... Uh, it was a form of welfare. I mean, we didn't have the kind of welfare uh, produced by the state so much um, until even the 20th century. Uh, the 19th century was pretty bad, and until we had Social Security, there were a lot of older people living in poverty in the United States, and that didn't start to get rectified until 1935. Uh, but in Muslim countries, uh, the custom is that if you have more than one wife, then you have to treat them all equally. And, um, and so it was a, a, their form of welfare. That's how they developed uh, welfare. And, uh, oh, by the way, I, uh, of all the Muslim men I know, um, only one was married to more than one wife. And he was married to two. He was a relatively young man. And uh, his life was hell on earth, as far as I could tell. <laughs> and uh, part of the problem was that one of the two wives didn't know about the other one. One knew, but one didn't know that the other one existed. And so when we were out do, trying to do business in the healthcare industry in Saudi Arabia, he was constantly on his cell phone trying to jug, juggle these two wives. 
And uh, so I can just imagine what it might, must be like to try to juggle four wives. Um, and uh, on the other side, I do know one woman who um, had, um, her husband had two wives. She was the, she was the second wife, and she was with him three days a week, and she had three days a week off. <laughs> and, and then there was there's Sabbath. And so I guess the men and women might be separated on Sabbath when they're uh, going to the mosque. But in any case, um, she was with her husband three days a week and three days a week off. And she loved it. <laughs> and, but, <laughs> but then, um, uh, in fairness, um, she was from a fairly wealthy and well-to-do family and her uh, husband was uh, a very successful uh, medical doctor in Saudi Arabia. So um, I don't know how it would work in lower classes of society, but anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. Clark says, I recently have been watching Boardwalk Empire and it has this post-World War II setting going. The effect on the men leading into the craziness of prohibition. Um, oh, post-World uh, post War I setting going. Um, and, uh, you know, we can all imagine that and what it was like during prohibition because nobody stopped drinking uh, because of prohibition. And so, um, you know, if you haven't seen A Dangerous Method, um, which is the story of um, Freud, Jung, and Sabina Spielrein, uh, before 19, well, it, it basically ends about 1913, but it was focused mainly on the period like 1904 to 1910. Um, I urge you to take a look at that. And um, one of the hilarious scenes in it is where Dr. Young is talking with uh, a patient in his mental hospital who happened also to be a psychotherapist named Otto Gross. And Otto said, well, this is how people are. And, um, you know, we, had, we need to recognize the way people are. And we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. I, wanna, I guess I'll just continue on um, with the next paragraph. And, then, and please do feel free, as you're listening to these paragraphs, uh, to uh, put some comments on the chat or ask questions. I'm going to talk about a few things and I'll move up my, what I did was I took, um, I took one or two portions of each paragraph. Some of these paragraphs are half a page long. And so I took one or two portions of each paragraph and put them in my notes, which you're seeing underneath here. And so this is going to be paragraph 264 now. Paragraph 264. As to all those, and they are many, who are not obliged to live in the present, it is extremely important that they should believe in the ideal of marriage and hold fast to it. Nothing is gained if a valuable ideal is merely destroyed and not replaced by something better. Therefore, even the women hesitate, whether they are married or not, to go over openly to the side of rebellion. But at least they do not follow the lead of that well-known authoress who, after trying out all sorts of experiments, ended up in a secure haven of matrimony, whereupon marriage became the best solution, and all those who did not achieve it could brood on their mistakes and end their days in pious renunciation. For the modern woman, marriage is not as easy as that. Her husband would have something to say on this score.
Okay, I'm going to continue on with uh, paragraph 265 also because there's a follow-on comments here. So long as there are legalistic clauses that lay down exactly what adultery is, women will have to remain with their doubts. But do our legislators even know what adultery is? Is their definition of it the final embodiment of the truth? From the psychological standpoint, the only one that counts for a woman, it is a wretched piece of bungling like everything else contrived by men for the purpose of codifying love. For a woman, love has nothing to do with marital misconduct, extramarital intercourse, deception of the husband, or any of the less savory formulas invented by the erotically blind masculine intellect and echoed by the self-opinionated demon in women. No one but the absolute believer in the inviolability of traditional marriage could perpetrate such breaches of good taste, just as only the believer in God can really blaspheme. Whoever doubts marriage in the first place cannot infringe against it, for him, the legal definition is invalid because, like St. Paul, he feels himself beyond the law, on the higher plane of love. But because the believers in the law so frequently trespass against their own laws, whether from stupidity, temptation, or mere viciousness, the modern woman begins to wonder whether she too may not belong to the same category. From the traditional standpoint, she does, and she has to realize this in order to smash the idol of her own respectability. To be respectable means, as the word tells us, to allow oneself to be seen. A respectable person is one who comes up to public expectations, who wears an ideal mask, in short, is a fraud. Good form is not a fraud. But when respectability represses the psyche, the God-given essence of man, then one becomes what Christ called a whited sepulcher. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a mouthful. Okay. And one of the things that uh, I've been worrying about, thinking about, is uh, the issue of why... Uh, half of our marriages are ending in divorce in the United States and what can be done about it. And uh, it, interestingly, as I was reading uh, earlier in this essay, uh, earlier today, Dr. Jung was saying at that time that a quarter of our marriages were ending in divorce. And so... Um, it's, it's really atrocious that we, we now don't really have marriage, in my view, uh, that, that can hold together in the way that medieval marriage would have held together, I suppose. <laughs> and that's thinking of marriage up through um, the beginning of the 20th century, let's say. Um, and so the question is, uh, how do we change it in a sensible way? Uh, because obviously I think that young women have been sold the idea that if their husband strays even one time, then boom, that's the end of it. And, um, and the marriage should be over. And it often is in the United States and I think in a lot of places. And I don't think that is healthy for society or um, mentally healthy, as Dr. Jung is trying to address some of these issues. So let me look at some of these questions. Um, Clark says, reading Jung today, I was noticing him say the unconscious was the past multiple times he explained it, it he explained its different effects um, yeah he talks about that a little bit more a little later on 
in this essay, I think I want to put this comment on, off until then. Uh, obviously, uh, the unconscious in the terms of dreams and that sort of thing is working with the past, not only your individual past, but also the past of uh, humanity itself. And um, and so you have the two million year old man in you. Uh, that's the evolutionary psyche, um, which that's how Dr. Jung describes it. I think we can say it was it's at least four million years old, but uh, as of now, uh, but. Obviously, the human psyche has been developing ever since life has been developing. And it's interesting that uh, Dr. Robert Johnson, in one of the other books that I was reading, uh, said that the only thing um, that life does effectively is seek consciousness. <laughs> uh, that's quite a statement. Uh, or the only thing the unconscious does effectively is find consciousness and move toward the light, I suppose. Um, if we remove the financial benefits to marriage vis-a-vis -vis taxes, the amount of successful marriages will go up. As it stands, it's currently just a way to save money while getting a master's degree. <laughs> uh, well, people can have that view, but, um, you know, and I, I think that one issue that we have is that we're living much longer. And so, you know, before the 19th century or even in the 19th century, people weren't living be beyond like 50. I mean, um, in the 17th century, when my ancestors came to the New World, uh, the average age was 40. And uh, so people were dying much younger. They were uh, basically just reproducing and maybe supporting children for a decade or so. And then that was the end. And, and now we have a different issues in our society that we need to think about maturely and uh, maturity is one of the issues that we want to uh, be discussing here. It's one of the issues that's that's rampant in our society. Um, let's see. Dan says, how do you expect young couples to realize marriage has to do with psychic connection before they've even established their egos? Well, that's a problem, but uh, we could start by talking with them about it. We aren't even doing that right now. And uh, we're not even explaining to them what their egos are. And so it seems to me that we need to educate are young much better about their own psyche and what to expect in their life psychologically um, before we kick them out of the nest. And whether we do it in our homes or in our schools, anyway, it needs to be done. And as you heard from this particular paragraph, uh, Dr. Jung was quite derisive about legislators trying to legislate what uh, propriety and what adultery and things like that are. Um, Clark says the negative effects of divorce for women aren't that significant. I'm not sure about that. I'm not, I'm not going to accept that one because, um, you know, while, while I do understand in some sense why average women's wages don't match men, um, and that being partially because women are not in the workplace for perhaps 15 or 20 years. And so they're not uh, advancing as, as much or as fast in society unless they have no children or unless they're uh, insane <laughs> and, and trying, trying to keep, have it all. Um, 
that's obviously very difficult. And I think that one of the things that we need to be thinking about it in society is helping uh, both men and women think about um, what they're really about. And obviously that's more important for women uh, because women carry the burden of having children and uh, typically of raising them because the courts normally will give uh, children to the, to the wife. Um, Clark says, financially, I mean, and only generally some states are different. Uh, what I would say, Clark, is that, uh, you know, I had a divorce, uh, and I'm not proud of it. it. It came after 17 years, and uh, in some ways, I'm sorry about it. Um, but I'm not sorry about it for being with Debbie. I'm very happy with Debbie, and I've been with Debbie now for uh, 32 years. Um, and, and so almost twice as long. Um, but um, I just couldn't get my wife, my first wife, through the psychological transformations that were needed so that we could be partners and mature adults together. I mean, uh, she basically had a mindset that wanted me to be her father and to step in and behave exactly like her father. And that wasn't going to be me, not at all, um, because I work heavily in my head, as you might guess from having heard some of the things that I talk about, and uh, I, it so happens that I'm allergic to everything that's green and grows, and so uh, I don't like to be outside gardening or cutting the grass. Uh, I, I did it today only because I have to, but, um, but you know, we have to get all of us in society to start understanding the transformations that we go through in life and the role, the maturity that we have to achieve um, going forward. Okay, so uh, let's see. Is it something held for review? Let's see. Um, okay, I, I've just, okay, that was Miles. Um, does marriage control the most dangerous substance in the world is testosterone, drug violence in Mexico, Mexico Institute, Woodrow Wilson Institute, Professor Shirk. Okay, um, well, I mean, we have dangerous drugs uh, of all kinds, but um, estrogen, I think, is also a dangerous drug in some ways. And... You know, obviously, if a marriage gets a crisis in it, uh, if there's an infidelity either by the man or the woman, um, then either estrogen or testosterone gets involved among friends. And, uh, you know, then, then you get somebody saying, you know, sue the bastard or, you know, or the opposite, you know leave it at that, and, uh, and then you have marriages collapsing instead of people becoming adults. But unfortunately, I don't think that it, hap it can happen at that time. I think we need to be much better about educating young people. Um, so let me go on with this reading here, um, and then we'll come back. I'll come back to your points. Paragraph 266. The modern woman has become conscious of the undeniable fact that only in this state of love can she attain the highest and best of what she is capable. And this knowledge drives her to the other realization that love is beyond the law. 
Her respectability revolts against this, and one is inclined to identify this reaction with public opinion. That would be the lesser evil. What is worse is that public opinion is in her blood. It comes to her like a voice from within, a sort of conscience, and this is the power that holds her in check. She is unaware that love, her most personal, most prized possession, could bring her into conflict with history. Such a thing would seem to her most unexpected and absurd. But who, if it comes to that, has fully realized that history is not contained in thick books, but lives in our very blood? The last part of that sentence again, just to remind you. History is not contained in thick books, but lives in our very blood. Okay, um, so the basic point here, and let me move up the, um, I guess it's up there, this is 266, um, that love is beyond the law, and, and also this point about history is not contained in thick books, but lives in our very blood. And so the this is a very important idea for um, everything in politics and, you know, in theology, in history, uh, in the way society works, um, because, and here's Arnold Toynbee, uh, there's a, a book, let me see if I can show these folks, um, this book, okay, so here's a book comparing uh, Toynbee and Dr. Jung, and Toynbee uh, was a very famous historian of the 20th century, and he uh, was one of the people who um, started to popularize the idea that history is far more than just a bunch of dates and who killed who and that sort of thing. It's actually... Um, uh, very important to understand what's happening in the psyche. And Dr. Edinger was talking about uh, things like the rise of communism and the rise of fascism in the 20th century as being psychic events. And obviously Nazism was a psychic epidemic. And we, I worry about this even today because if we look at... Um, the current administration, um, our president was derided by members of the GOP only a year and a half ago. In 2016, uh, nobody thought he was for real, and they were very derisive of him. But now, all of a sudden, we find um, people who are otherwise per perfectly responsible um, GOP senators and congressmen who are coming under the knuckle of um, our president. And, uh, you know, if, if you're a supporter of his, his I, I apologize if I offend you, but nonetheless, um, he offends me because he uh, seems to be breaking down everything in our society. And I think that that's very dangerous, and I think that uh, we can see a creeping psychic epidemic uh, starting to take place in the United States, and unless uh, people stand up and stop it, uh, it's going to take over, and we're going to have a very bad time of it, and uh, it, we have to remember that it took Nazism 10 years to overcome um, the German psyche and to become an epidemic there, it, it actually functioned for 22 years, but the first 10, uh, it was just building up. In 1923, Adolf Hitler was alone with six other guys in a room talking about what they wanted to do, and by 1933, 10 years later, he was elected Chancellor of Germany with the largest uh, 
result in history at, up to that time. I think Angela Merkel has done better. Uh, but then it was uh, that psychic epidemic was simply unstoppable until all the crockery was broken. And, uh, and then, as Dr. Jung said, then you have to root out the evil root and branch. Okay, so... Um, So Miles says he quoted Professor Shirk because over 90% of murderers and victims are men. Um, Clark says, I feel like this essay's audience was women. Uh, Miles says, according to his study, okay, that's going back to Shirk's study. Clark says he exposes the dark truth within them, their fatal weaknesses and failures as representatives who should be about compromise. I think that what was going on, Clark, was the fact that um, most women wanted a marriage and, and what they perceived to be a security of the marriage, but at the same time, the society needed uh, young people after World War I. And uh, so the women that didn't have husbands uh, were going to have to have them out of wedlock unless uh, you know, less immaculate conception took place. And so, yes, I do agree that this was an essay addressed to women. Uh, and in fact, the essay is called Woman in Europe. So, uh, so the very name of it uh, suggests that he's addressing himself to woman. Uh, and uh, he often talked about the need to uh, say things that most people don't want to know, uh, and he had to do it in a judicious way. So I'm, I'm just using this as a way of showing how difficult his position was uh, during this interregnum period. Um, so... Um, Clark says he was Trump. Yeah, uh, that's right. I'd like to get to my big idea tonight from reading, which was the past appearing as our unconscious. Um, yes, in two ways. I think we addressed this, Clark, but let me address it once again. Um, the past is our unconscious in the sense that the things that we carry with us uh, evolutionarily are past and they are the development of our unconscious. You know, 99% of our unconscious uh, we never have any access to because uh, it does things like uh, regenerate the cells in our heart and our brain and and region, or maybe not in our brain, but it certainly does in our heart and in uh, all of our other organs. They say that all the cells in our body regenerate every seven years. And so all of that is going on, um, and we never even know about it, but it's only because of the past that th those things are happening. That's from an evolutionary point of view. Now, from an um, experiential point of view, uh, obviously, when you have dreams, when I have a dream about a, uh, a city that's on a river that lets out onto a seashore where there can be a tsunami, that picture came from uh, pictures that, that I've seen in my lifetime. I mean, even uh, the city where I live, Annapolis, Maryland, is a city like that exactly. Uh, although my dream image was not Annapolis, but... Um, but I've had many, many experiences. My father was a naval officer, so uh, throughout my lifetime I've had many experiences in cities like that. And so my unconscious knows that there's that image in my unconscious. And it, if it wants to tell me something, it can draw that image out, up, and put it together. Now, I'm not saying that that image was an actual picture that I ever saw, 
I would say that the picture of the busy harbor with 50 or so different types of uh, floating vehicles from ships to small launches uh, in my dream two nights ago, uh, that was an image that my psyche made up. I never saw that place before. Um, but it certainly, the general idea of it certainly came from things that I have experienced. And so, uh, yes, your unconscious is always dealing with what it's got uh, available to it, both from an evolutionary point of view and from this experiential point of view. Now, I'll give you one example of that. When I was about five years old, I had a dream of a dinosaur. And uh, I, had, I had seen at that time, there was, a, there was a movie at that time, and I'm talking about 1953 maybe, so I was maybe seven years old. Um, and so in 1953, there was a black and white movie which was sort of the, the day's answer to Jurassic Park. And so a, a dinosaur did come to life, but it was more like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So I know what, I remember what the dinosaur in that movie looked like. But within a couple of days of that dream, or that seeing that movie, I had a dream of a dinosaur with a very long neck and the dinosaur could eat um, leaves 40 feet off the, off the ground. And my dream was that I was looking up out of the window of my home, which happened to be in Kodiak, Alaska at the time, and I could look up and see the top of this very long-necked dinosaur. And so I've seen those dinosaurs afterward in the Museum of Natural History, but I had never seen that dinosaur before that time. Definitely I had never seen it. And, um, and so that image definitely came from the evolutionary history, and not only evolutionary hisp history, but evolutionary history that went back more than 65 million years. Um, so uh, these things are very, very deep in us, and they, they are um, in the past. I agree with that. Um, so our... Uh, Let me go back here. All right, so Clark says, Hitler was the result of the Weimar Republic. Prohibition was the Great War. And Trump is the rise of all these social problems like opioids. Well, you know, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. There, these things are very complicated. Okay, Miles says Eve was sent to be rescuer, but her role is more often translated as helper. Uh, okay, we're, we're going to get into that shortly. I'm going to continue with the video, but uh, Clark says, I think we need a, a woman to save us as men from the tragedy that is our past, and this happens on the larger level as well. We don't need a tough man, but healing of Christ, absolutely. Are we moving into the age of woman? Um, well, let me uh, cut to the chase because we're gonna run into uh, a time problem here, uh, but let me just read to you uh, the, the last, um, Uh, let me just read to you uh, paragraph 275, which sort of addresses this, and then we'll go back. But uh, the indirect, uh, wait a minute. Okay, going back to 274. It is the way of woman as of nature 
to work indirectly without naming her goal. To anything unsatisfactory, she reacts purposively with moods, outbursts of effects, opinions, and actions that all have the same end in view, and their apparent senselessness, virulence, and cold-blooded ruthlessness are infinitely distressing to the man who is blind to Eros. The indirect method of woman is dangerous, for it can hopelessly compromise her aim. That is why she longs for greater consciousness, which would enable her to name her goal and give it meaning and thus escape the blind dynamism of nature. In any other age, it would have been the prevailing religion that showed her where her ultimate goal lay, but today, religion leads back to the Middle Ages, back to that soul-destroying unrelatedness from which came all the fearful barbar barbarities of war. Too much soul is reserved for God, too little for man. But God himself cannot flourish if man's soul is starved. The feminine psyche responds, and here, here's the punchline now, the feminine psyche rep, uh, responds to this hunger, for it is the function of Eros to unite what Logos has sundered. The woman of today is faced with a tremendous cultural task. Perhaps it will be the dawn of a new era. So that's how uh, Dr. Jung ends this um, piece that, I, that we're reading here. Um, but as Clark says, women are the start and the end of the journey. Um, and Miles says, that's interesting, Clark. Our psyche is dealing with the unconscious, the past, as it manifests in the present and brings up the shadow. Absolutely, of course it does. Uh, but it happens on a large level as well. And that's what we have that we're experiencing now, very definitely. Um, and uh, so... Uh, what we're seeing, and I could refer you back uh, to uh, meeting number three of this group. This is, we're in meeting number 78 now, but in the very early part of uh, the young reading group, uh, you will find a discussion by me of uh, what is represented by um, by our president right now, and um, and it all relates to this quote, which I can never remember it exactly. So I have now got it taped to the front of my <laughs> I have it taped to the front of my uh, computer so that I can remember it. It is too much of the animal distorts civilized man. Too much civilization makes sick animals. And so I think what he's saying is that too much logos will also make sick animals and that the opposite of logos is life. Okay, you can, uh, you know, whatever we can say about any book. Okay, here's a book and this book is, um, is dead. There's nothing alive about this book. And there's nothing alive about the words that we put on the chat. What is alive is the interaction that we're having now and how that interaction might affect you later on in your life. Um, maybe not today. May, it may be 10 years from now. Suddenly, this discussion will come to your mind and and it will mean something and that will be alive and so the only chance of anything being alive is through eros and so as dr young says at the end of this um, article um, it's the job of eros to unite uh, and we were talking in the uh, answer to job group uh, the other day and uh, maybe i should repeat it here that at you know at the time uh, of Job and Christ, okay, so we're talking about a period 
between 500 to um, 500 BCE to the time of Christ and beyond, uh, and going all the way back to the the really ancients uh, like Abraham and uh, Moses, um, the world was not rational, and uh, it was very hard to build up civilization. The only place that we know civilization was built up in what we consider the West and the Middle East right now uh, was Egypt. And even that was, um, was not very rational for most people. It was uh, a God um, society where the Pharaoh was God. Um, and so rationality had to be introduced and so when we talk about Christ being the logos, it's discernment, it's cutting through the BS and coming up with the things that we really need. And we have that uh, today. We have to cut through the BS. And, and so, yes, there needs to be logos, but... Um, and so cutting through um, the idea of murdering people in the Colosseum, okay, that, you know, made some sense, and people started to do that, uh, you know, that they stopped murdering people in the Colosseum. I don't know when that stopped, but, um, but anyway... Um, So the Logos came in, in the form of Christ's teachings, and he was the Logos, and the Bible became the Logos, and so everybody tried to follow the Bible. Um, but the Bible isn't alive, okay? The Bible is a book, <laughs> and, and it's a thick book, um, and it's got a lot of images in it uh, that... that have the potential of being alive. This is one of the great things that Dr. Jung talks about is how to revivify, to bring back to life the images from the Bible. Uh, but first we need uh, Christian theologians to see that that's necess necessary. And um, until they do, and they don't want to because their livelihood depends upon um, upon people coming to them as the intermediary between the people and God. And so they have no incentive to do that. But then people keep turning away from uh, from religion. And when we turn away from religion, then we lose a lot of things we lose ex access to morality and this, etc. And this is part of the issue that is being addressed in this essay. Um, now we have ten minutes left before our friends at YouTube uh, will start cutting the beginning of this um, evening meeting off, and. Uh, and so even though I would love to go all the way through this, I don't want to lose uh, this recording. And so uh, I think that maybe what we should do is uh, hold the rest of this off until next week and continue the discussion. Now, uh, let me ask uh, the people that are on chat uh, whether this discussion has been at all useful. I mean, I see that we have quite a number of people that have come in uh, over the course of the evening so far, and um, it, I'd like to hear from those that are online and, and active in the chat uh, if this has been useful at all, if, um, if you would be in favor of trying to continue this discussion, uh, and the, the rest of this article as a further discussion next week, or whether you would prefer uh, to uh, move on to something else. And if something else, then please give me some advice 
about what you'd uh, like to talk about, um, either uh, on the chat or uh, you can also send me email. I think most of you have my email address. So, um, so anyway, um, Miles says, Skip, my socks are missing again because you're knocking them off. <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> okay, thank you. I guess that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry, Clark. I'm not much of a, of a comedian. Um, maybe I'll find something funny in the future, but um, this was a pretty serious talk tonight. Um, And Clark says, so glad you got to the point about the Bible. It's like talking about the Buddhist stuff. Um, so Miles says, yes, keep, let's keep it going. Clark says, I was able to do the reading for today, so I felt I could speak on the subject. Whatever we talk about, I must appreciate being able to know what we're talking about ahead of time. Uh, I, will do, I will do my best to do better with that. Uh, and if I do it and want to get the message to you, I will be putting it in the, um, in the announcement for this live stream, okay, which is on the URL that you are currently watching. So if you go to the URL where it's, you're currently watching, uh, I will try to be putting, um, the various readings, uh, as you'll see for today, if you just scroll down under the video that is currently being broadcast to you, you will see the assignment for Thursday for Answer to Job, and that's going to be a rock'em sock'em um, discussion because I worked very hard on that yesterday. Um, and so this is a uh, paragraph 713 to 733 of Answer to Job. It's not the most controversial paragraphs, but it is uh, going to be uh, another very interesting uh, discussion. Um, so uh, anyway, just come to this URL even when it's not on online, and you will be able to find what I'm trying to put, make you aware of for uh, our next session uh, in the discussion. I keep changing that as we go forward. Um, and so dance is very useful. Let's continue next week. Future reading. The essay, Marriage is a Psychological Relationship. Uh, this is paragraphs 324 to 345 in volume 17, The Development of the Personality. That is a very important uh, essay, Dan. And I will st start to put that together, and hopefully we could start that next week. I, since we started talking about marriage, uh, I think uh, that's a very logical follow-on. And so I will endeavor to do a reading on that and, um, and start presenting it. I, I'd like to finish what we're doing right now, um, but... Um, Maybe uh, as early as next week, we could begin that. Uh, and Clark says, I appreciate all the meetings I'm able to attend. By the way, there's always something worthwhile that generally makes my day. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm making anybody's day, but I'm trying to... Um, speak common sense, not rationality. I think, I think we ought to be speaking common sense that includes both logos and eros within it um, because we have to live and just discerning doing logos type things where we, where we split things and split them again and split them again uh, we finally split them down to the point where you can't live anymore. And, and then, uh, as this quote from Dr. Jung, uh, too much civilization makes sick animals. So um, civilization, which in this essay, Dr. 
Jung was talking about men trying to define adultery. Um, you know, you can cut and uh, you can slice and dice that one uh, any which way but loose, but uh, it's not really going to change the animal side of us, and uh, it's going to make sick animals. And so I'm not, I'm not saying yay to promiscu promiscuity. Please don't uh, put that one on me. Um, but I think that we need a bit more common sense about our lives because. Um, if we educate people better about the way life can be, and you know, ironically, it's almost all men on this uh, YouTube channel. I mean, I think I have about 11% uh, female audience here. <coughs> and <coughs> ironically, in the statistics, um, the women don't show up until the 45 to 54 age group and until then it's almost all men up until age 45 and in the age group for 45 to 54 it becomes 89 percent women <coughs> believe it or not and uh, then after 54, it goes 100% men. It's just unbelievable what the statistics, the demographic statistics show on this um, YouTube channel. So uh, it's almost all men that are getting these messages. Uh, and uh, whether you're a man or a woman, I urge you to think about how we can educate our counterparts uh, to... Uh, understand the psychological transformations that we have to go through in our lifetime with a real eye to the fact that we're now going to live until we're 100. My wife who works at hospice gets a lot of these specifics, uh, uh, statistics, and she says that right now, every year we're increasing life expectancy by three months, every year. And within 20 years, we're going to be increasing life expectancy year for year. And so God knows what that's going to mean for society. Um, but, you know, we have to think about what it means for how we interact uh, with one another. And obviously, I think it's very important that we have uh, relationships with our partners, regardless of sex. Um, and I know that my wife and I uh, have, you know, we do compliment our, one another quite a lot. And um, fortunately, it works pretty well for us in this marriage. But, you know, looking back, I see where my mistakes were in my first marriage. And um, if, if I had known the things then that I know now, uh, I wouldn't have uh, gotten out of that marriage, honestly. Uh, and so that's uh, something to think about. Um, let's see. Clark says, thanks for sharing your time. It was great, and hopefully others see this in the future. Uh, usually they do. We usually get a lot of people. And uh, I think the YouTube algorithm really pushes people in weird directions like, they go to YouTube, then they're not shown this stuff exists. Um, geez, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm getting more and more subscribers every day. Uh, we're up over, well over 1,100 now. And um, so somebody's watching it. And, uh, you know, this week we had uh, uh, my statistics. Um, I, I keep... I've been keeping statistics since the beginning, um, and so the statistics as of this morning, uh, total 83,305 views, uh, minutes watched in the last 28 days, 92,990, that's in the last 28 days, and views in the last 28 days, this is a record, 
11,599. So take those numbers and divide by 28, uh, and you'll know how much we're getting every day watching the replays of these things. So um, the minutes watched is 92,990, and the views is 11,599 as of this morning, and that's on 608 videos that I've published. Uh, but I am now fresh out of time, and so I need to get off this stream, and I apologize for leaving quickly. Uh, I'll see you again either next week at the same time, or Thursday at 1.30. I may come online at r random other times. If I do, I'll try to give a little bit of advance warning uh, for other readings as I prepare for, um, for example, this uh, marriage as a psychological uh, relationship. And uh, uh, I will try to do a reading of that, so there will be a behind the scenes. So I ex I'm sorry I have to excuse myself, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you for coming.